Welcome to the Naked Podcaster. Get ready to hear the story of someone strong enough to bear it all. The Naked Podcaster is a representation of freeing yourself, giving you permission to be real in all your quirkiness, baggage, struggles to success, and tragedy to triumph. I'm so excited you're joining the journey. Your past doesn't define you, but it does lead you on a path to today. Let's get naked. Welcome to the Naked Podcaster. This is Jen Taylor, and today I am on with Jasmine Shozai. Jasmine, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Excellent. I'm really excited to have you on. You have a story that I don't think is, I think it's more common than we realize, but people don't talk about it, so I'm really glad that you're discussing that with me today. Yeah, no, I'm very honored. Tell me about you right now, what you're doing now, because I have cyber stalked you, but not everybody else knows who you are yet. So fill us in. Um, so yeah, my name is Jasmine Shodrai. I'm born and raised in Australia, but I'm half Persian, half German. And yeah, basically I've been doing modeling for a while now, and I'm also an aspiring actress. And where do you spend most of your, you're Persian and German. Do you speak German? Um, I do understand a little bit of German. Actually, I understand German very well, more than I can speak it. Um, as for Persian, not as well, but you know, there's like, it's like I need a bit of more training on both, but yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a very interesting background. I love it. And where do you call home now? Um, like I still call Australia my home, but obviously if people have seen my Instagram, I've been doing a lot of different trips. Um, well, not only just trips, but doing a lot of photo shoots out in the States and in Canada. So I guess in, in a way, like, you know, every time I visit certain places, it definitely feels like great to be there and um you know one day i'm i'm actually looking to move out of australia and kind of grow big um in the u.s and it's, it's kind of like a working thing but um i think at least from and this is where a lot of australian talent will understand this more than anyone else <laughs> but at least from a career perspective there's definitely in comparison there's definitely so many opportunities especially um well, actually whether you're an actor or model there's a lot of lot more opportunities um out in the states so yeah a lot of australian talent can definitely feel that so um yeah i personally know a few people kind of doing the same thing as i am so <laughs> That's excellent. So you you split your time between Australia and LA. Yeah, like um, I pretty much do. LA has been the like number one place outside of Australia where I've been to more often than anywhere else. Um, I do have plans to kind of travel the world a bit more, but um, yeah, it takes a lot of time and funding. So <laughs> yeah. no kidding. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. So you're doing modeling and we and your pictures are beautiful. So your your background is very unique. And I looked at those and um you've been in you've wanted that since you were a child. Yeah, like I think deep down as a child I always I don't know, like I guess then you were very young, so you don't really know anything about the industry or only what you see on TV but even then like I, I just felt so inspired by a lot of the celebrities and models that I used to watch and I, I was like well that that must be so cool you know I wish I was like that and um, yeah it wasn't until like I was 21 that I just you know went ahead and started modeling so <laughs> And that's, you are late to the game, but not, it doesn't matter. You've also, tell me about your music videos, commercial, um, the film that you had a part in. So yeah, the film um, I had a part in was like, it was a supporting role. So I played Anastasia in a film called The Alliance. I just received the DVD today in the mail because I'm in Australia right now. And um, I, I have to say there was a lot going on in the film, but I was only there for three days, so I was, yeah, I didn't have enough involvement to kind of capture everything, and um, yeah, no, it was very interesting, because so I got to, I had the role to, or basically I was playing the girlfriend or the love interest of the main character, so um, she is obviously in love with him, but she doesn't really know the stuff or how deep he's into the whole 
criminal side of things. So <laughs> she's kind of oblivious to, to all of that in a way. And I, even I was in a sense personally, cause yeah, like I said, um, I was only, yeah, no, I was only filming for two days. Um, I was only in Seattle where it was filmed for a very short period of time. So only, you know, from, from that point of view, only got to see a little bit, but if people head on to IMDb, the film is there, including all the cast and everyone who obviously, yeah, were involved. So, um, yeah, it was a very interesting role to play. It was kind of like my first film role. <laughs> so it was, I was very new, but I had a, had a very good time. Um, Commercial-wise, I have done a commercial for Playboy Energy Drinks Australia. Um, it was, I mean, it was kind of big, but it didn't really have – like a big song and dance, if you know what I mean. Admittedly, at least according to what my manager found out, <laughs> the, like, I guess the, the company itself, Playboy Energy Drinks Australia, didn't really get that far in Australia for some reason. I, I'm not even sure why. So it was like one of those things that I definitely enjoy doing. But yeah, from the publicity side of things, the, um, I guess the whole company didn't really go as big as they thought they would. Um, which was very interesting. Um, and, but on that note, and I know a lot of people don't know this is that a lot of magazines, um, more related to the men's magazines industry really died down in Australia. So we basically only have Maxim, um, and we have a couple of like really explicit magazines, but they're not that big. And even Penthouse itself kind of is more in line last time I heard. So it's, it's, it's definitely interesting for, for the whole being a glamour model in Australia. So for the most part, um, according to myself, of course, and other glamour models, um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of glamour modeling is also done more internationally, whether you're, you know, whether you're based in Australia or not, because there isn't as much um, opportunities for that over here. So it's, yeah, (laughs) so that's the story of its own. Um, And then, yeah, I've done a couple of music videos with local artists. Um, They were mainly like, yeah, R&B sort of music videos. That's awesome. And then you were also in a mini series. Yeah, so that was at the Phoenix. It was a really inspiring project because they partially did it or yeah, they partially did it because there was this really like iconic bar that's been open for years now um, in in the area and they, they were closing down due to all these like problems that happened in the past and what happened was um, they, yeah, they decided to do the mini series um, in honor of that to try and bring, like, yeah, to, to try and shed more light on what was happening and try and restore the, like, yeah, try and restore it basically because they didn't want the, a lot of people didn't want the place to shut down. And, um, yeah, no, so basically the, the role I had for that was a main role and I was... Yeah, I, I had a really great time because I, it, funny enough, I was playing this very catty or bitchy character and um, <laughs> I, I played it quite re- well. Like I really got into the character and I really, I felt that was like my first main role. Well, it was my first main role but at the same time it was the first experience I had where I really got in the character shoes and I you know I really got to be someone and play that role very authentically and um yeah it was very interesting and the people I met on that set were incredible as well why do you think as far as the modeling industry is concerned or the the men's magazines in Australia is there a reason that you know of that there aren't as many of them as here in the US um directly I I cannot really pinpoint why but in saying that and this is where things get really bizarre um there there was this 
there, there, there were these problems in Australia that legitimately happened. I'm not sure nationwide, but basically they stopped some laws of some sort. And, and according to the media, which you can always believe, is um, it's caused by this feminist wave, which is... Uh, like I have my own idea of feminism, so this is where um, whether the media is lying or not, this is where I don't agree with it. Where a lot of women, apparently, um, but I'm sure a lot of other people too, um, like basically what there were a lot of complaints, and they got rid of the grid girls um, for Formula Formula One races. So, and they got a, um, they got rid of a lot of ring girls as well. Um, and I'm not sure if this is nationwide, but see, that all connects with the whole men's magazine industry as well. So they got rid of a lot of things that weren't even that bad to begin with, to be honest. And to me, the ironic thing is if they're going to get rid of that, they may as well get rid of all the, um, which again, I, I'm not trying to sound rude. So, cause I'm a very open-minded person, obviously <laughs> posing for playboy and all that. So if they were going to get rid of those, I, I figured, well, why don't they get rid of the entire, um, male entertainment in, or entire entertainment industry in the sense that they may as well have gotten rid of all of the, the strip clubs. They may as well have got ridden, like they may as well have blocked you know, people from seeing porn in Australia because they pretty much, you know, said that, um, like, from what I heard or from what I saw in the media, they pretty much said it was just like, in a way, discriminating women by having, like, grid girls um, during Formula One races, which most people will know are just girls in um, uniform, like dresses, and um, pretty much promoting or helping the audience feel more engaged, you know, into the race. And the same with ring girls, except maybe, you know, maybe then they'll have a bikini on or something. But again, like if, if they were, if people really thought nationwide that had to be, you know, banned, then they may as well have banned everything else. Um, so it was, it was really strange. And I was briefly speaking about this with another photographer and um, here in Australia. And even they thought it was just weird that these things were happening. Um, so yeah, in Australia, we're having a very funny phase at the moment, but for some reason, um, reasons that I don't really know, <laughs> they were getting rid of a lot of things. Um, and you know, for a lot of glamour models or even models that just like to do those sp specific type of jobs. It's, um, yeah, it's making a very negative impact. That's a shame. I was wondering if there was something specific just because unless you ban everything, I, I wasn't, it didn't, it didn't make sense to me why that was being singled out. So basically mm. we don't entirely know and it's too bad, but yeah, let's take some time now and go back as far back as you want, because I know you're first generation Australian. We've gotten that far. And you started modeling at 21, which isn't later or earlier per se. You you weren't in it as a kid, though. You weren't like a child model or anything like that. You did it on your own. And I actually am highlighting this a second time because that's part of the story of yours that I adore the most. So take me back to whenever you want to start, uh, when things started to get a little bit more difficult. Um, I mean, in terms of things getting very difficult or even, even slightly before that, I just found during my teenage years in general, I was very tomboyish. I didn't really have confidence in myself or in my body, I should say. So that was a really big thing. So there was a lot of things happening in high school, as most people can imagine. Um, and yeah, no, basically I, um, yeah, basically that was a difficult time for me, but I suppose in, you know, like I was a bit of a late bloomer as well. So it wasn't really until I was like 17 or 18, I started getting um, confidence in myself body wise. Um, but yeah, it wasn't until yeah 21 that I started my modeling career. But prior to that, I, you know, went through some negative things as well. So unfortunately I was in a domestic violence relationship for several months and that was a very ho horrific and very negative period of time. Um, 
even now it still impacts me. And I always say like, you know, when you fold a piece of paper, like, you know, in, in many different areas and you try and flatten out again, it's just not the same. It may not be crunched up, but it's not the same um, afterwards. So, you know, basically what I'm trying to say is it definitely made me a stronger person, but it definitely, which most victims can understand, definitely still impacts me a little bit um, even now. And I think the, the best thing that I ever did, and I would say this to everyone who, you know, goes through this sort of stuff, um, is to do something for yourself, do something for your life despite of that. Because um, as much as, you know, you may have been the one who chose to be in that relationship or, you know, I mean, relationships are a two-way street anyway. You know, they it doesn't mean you chose to be in that negative um, environment. It's not like you wanted to, to have, you know, violence put against you. So the main thing is, is to, when you get out of that, is definitely do something for yourself. Because another thing I've realized, and it happens so, it's so common, you know, especially when I got out of it, I had a lot of people that I knew personally come out to me and say, you know what, this, this happened to me before, or I had a, you know, I had an ex that treated me like this. So it was, it was amazing to see how many women really were impacted by domestic violence in some way or another. And basically, um, well, I'm losing my words. <laughs> Basically, what I'm trying to say is you definitely need to move on with your life despite of what had happened before. And you definitely will find that in a lot of domestic violence relationships, the, the person who's doing the wrong um, often mentally makes the victim feel very bad and feel very useless. So you definitely want to be the opposite of that when you, if you were to, when you come out of it. So, yeah. I want to talk a little bit, I, I would love to talk more about the relationship just because it isn't the people that don't understand, like, why would you stay or why would you allow this? It doesn't start that way. You don't mm. meet a person and he says hi and slaps you across the face, but asks if you want to go home and you, you know, like it's yeah. insidious. It's like, it'll be something little here and something little here and something else there. And there's, there is space in between the violence that sometimes these people are very good at making that time very lovely. And you think, Oh wait, it, it's not that bad because there's all these great things about the relationship. Can you go in a little bit more and, and with the things that you experience? I also a hundred percent agree. The second you say something, you realize how many people around you are experiencing the same thing. Yeah. So with me anyway, and, and again, um, it was very common to hear how often it happened to other people, you know, it would be that little bit of good things and a little bit of bad things, or like he would do something really bad, but later on he would make it seem it wasn't as bad as I thought it was, even though technically my human instinct is there for a reason. <laughs> um, or he would do these other amazing things in between, in between, or he'd make me feel guilty and say, the reason why I'm treating you this way is because you need to grow up or you need to be, you know, this, this, all of this is like assertive, um, assertive qualities in a relationship. But then I think, again, you need to know better as a person, you need to listen to your instincts, instincts and assertiveness is definitely not violence. So I guess in a relationship, it may not be that obvious, but to people on the outside, they'll be able to see instantly that, yeah, that person's not being assertive. They're being aggressive. They're being violent. They're being unfair. So it's, it's definitely hard to see when you're in it, when you're in the center of the whole problem and you're the victim, it's, it can often be hard to, yeah, definitely see what's really going on when to everyone else, it can be very obvious. And, um, yeah, again, unfortunately for me and for, again, for a lot of people, um, outsiders don't really see it until maybe a little bit in or even halfway or even when it's almost too late. So yeah, for me, it wasn't until like halfway in that people would, would say or notice that something was wrong. And, um, yeah, unfortunately, 
for for a lot of people and again in my case I had a lot of friends that were with me and a lot of people that kind of took his side which to this very day I don't understand still but then I think well there are bad people and good people everywhere you go and quite often you're going to witness that firsthand and that was my first proper like first-hand experience of seeing people that were obviously supporting the wrong thing and I couldn't help that there was no and it wasn't my fault I didn't or other people society didn't tell them to pair up with somebody that obviously was mistreating me you know what I mean that's their own decision so again like as I was getting out of the domestic violence situation and even now I was I always tell myself I'm not to blame for what happened I may have been a part of it but I didn't tell people to be violent towards me I didn't tell people to support violence against me so um in the end you know I disconnected with so many people in that situation because I decided and I was convinced with the help of the you know with counseling and so on that I deserved more and yeah moving forward yeah I disconnected from a lot of people and it was really funny because I did an interview around the time that I won Australia's top gun model of 2017 and 2018. Um, I, yeah, I did an interview about that and my domestic violence, how I grew from um, that to this national title winner. And when a lot of people read that article, because it was very popular online, um, a lot of my acquaintances and friends that were around that period of time came to me and said I, that they had no idea that was actually happening. So <laughs> it's it's very funny because a lot of, again, a lot of victims think, why don't people care about me when they first come out of these situations? And I learned, yeah, either people do support you either people don't support you unfortunately and again it's not your fault um or there will be people who aren't even aware of what's going on and that could just simply be because they were so busy and they just you know they they had other things going on that they couldn't they didn't have you know time to see what was happening behind closed doors for you so that was another thing i noticed when I got out of that situation. I think also we don't, we are absorbed in what's going on in our own lives, but it's not very common. I don't think to look at a situation and question whether or not it's abusive. I think on the surface, things look great, you know, to other people, we can make things look great. And if you're in a, you're expressing exactly what I think most people feel like, is this my fault? Did I do something? You know, he's telling you I'm doing this to to teach you. So you grow up or it was your fault and you feel like you're going crazy. Like, well, Mm. is it my fault? Maybe I did do something. Do I need to learn from like you do, you know, it's not right, but you do question it also. Like maybe it's not as bad as I think. And, and then there are the good times in between. And I think other people, they don't, we're good at hiding things from the world if we don't want to see them. And, and if you're questioning, is this your fault or am I wrong? Or, well, it's good today. Or he did this nice thing. You know, people, people are only kind of seeing what the front that we put on. And sometimes I think people are only seeing what they want. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, so, it's and it's it's interesting. I love that you said that you just cut off from people and there were people that supported him. That's great. You don't need them. <laughs> like, yeah, definitely not. <laughs> goodbye. Um, that's fine. Misery loves company. They can hang out together. Um, but isn't it crazy how much you look around and people are not supportive when you finally speak up for yourself? Was that that was that really shocking to you? Because it's shocking to me. Well, it definitely was shocking to me, especially at that point, still coming out of it. But in saying that, like I said, I knew, I I mean, I'm not saying that I was dumb or that anyone is dumb in domestic, in that sort of situation, but I was slowly getting a little bit smarter towards the end of that. And I knew that there were people even, like I said, the relationship hadn't ended yet, but I knew there were people supportive of him that I thought were my friends but they weren't. Mm-hmm. And that, that was the underlying point. The underlying po- point, it didn't matter how they looked like or what gender they were. The fact that they were supporting that and being supported, 
not supporting me. In other words, they may have been, they, they themselves may have been just as violent towards me as, as he was because they were supporting that anyway. You know what I mean? So they were just as bad. And I was like, well, no, this isn't, this is, this is terrible. I'm not going to hang out with people that thinks that think it's okay to be abusive towards me. You know what I mean? Whether that's not what they technically are thinking, but if you're, I always believe if you're supporting, like if you're watching somebody rob a bank and you think it's funny or you think whatever of it, but you don't think it's, the right if you're not going to call the police or tell anyone then you're just as bad so that that's what i think in terms of those situations and and in terms of the domestic violence situation so um for me it was just very important to not have those people around i don't deserve that in fact nobody does and um you know as much as i i don't try and interfere with other people's lives or I, I try not to wish people bad luck because that's probably a bad thing to, or rude thing to do. I'm sure if they kept on or if anyone kept on with that sort of behavior that, you know, karma would eventually get back to them, you know? So, um, it's, it was, yeah, in all honesty, it was like one of those situations. And, um, I think again, like it all comes down to the individual in that case, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that people who do that are the worst people on earth, but again, if, if they as an individual don't know any better or they just weren't raised, um, in, in a, in a good way, then, you know, of course they'll perhaps do stuff like that so for me it didn't matter who they were it's just that I wasn't going to stay with people who honestly did not care about me and that was it isn't that crazy I like I like you um saying it like they're an accessory to the crime if once you once you know that this person has done certain things and you are okay with it you are like an accessory to the crime well you pretty were you pretty outspoken about what he had done in the relationship? Um, I mean, again, relating back to the interview, um, and, it, and it, it all depends on what people want to hear or what they don't want to hear. But in terms of the interview that I did back then, um, yeah, they I did supply with them or they did publish some things as far as they wanted to go um, about what happened. So I'm technically short-sighted. So if I'm not wearing my contact lenses, I have to wear glasses. So there'll be times we'd have this really heated argument and um, whether he was pushing me or whether it was, you know, he was just being aggressive to me verbally, he'd sometimes like, you know, take my glasses off and toss it away in the other corner, like literally throw it away so I couldn't see. So it was... Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was it was violence. It was it was abuse in a way, and um, I guess without being too like vivid, without being too much into detail, yeah, he was this um, abusive person physically, emotionally. Um, yeah, he it was a very difficult time for me, and um, as I mentioned before, um, when I got out. And when I was reading other stories online, a lot of people had been through a very similar thing. So it was more common than I thought, but that wasn't a good thing. At least I could relate to other people or they could relate to me, but it wasn't good to hear that so many people were going through it. No kidding. (laughs) That's, that's not a good thing that so many people can relate. Mm. And what about family? Did you have support from family, your parents or... Um, yeah, I definitely did. Like my parents definitely noticed something again towards like the end. And again, I was being very secretive about it. I wasn't really telling much people. And I I mean, I can't remember why, but I think a lot of the time you're very insecure in those situations. So you don't even realize it. You don't even realize you're technically, you know, keeping a secret. But again, it's, it's, you're the victim. You, You shouldn't really be blaming yourself. I mean, if you're already feeling scared and insecure, often you won't really feel that comfortable to go out and tell everyone. Yeah. But yeah, towards the end I was, and towards the end, I think a lot of people knew what was going on. And, um, to this very day, um, and again, I, I, I don't, I'm not saying that everybody including him actually are the worst people on earth. But to this very day, I, I think everyone knows now, and I like in every situation what really happened. 
So it's, I'm glad that it's out in the open because the last thing you want when you go through a very bad period of time, especially with that, you don't want it, you don't want to keep it a secret and not have everyone know because people need, deserve to tell the truth, at least the people around you. Um, yeah, sorry, people deserve to know the truth. So if you don't say anything, then nobody can help you. And in a way, you're not warning others if you're not saying anything either <laughs> because um, you know what I mean? It's because often you'll see these situations where things are kept a secret and I'm not saying that this is the case in my case or in anyone else's, but the people who do wrong will then continue to do the wrong thing because no one has spoken up. So it's definitely good to be very open about it and tell the people who basically care about you. I agree. I always say, you know, if if someone's coming home and being abusive and going out with other women or whatever they're doing and nothing's being said, then they've got a pretty good deal. Yeah. <laughs> like, like why? They're not going to stop on their own. They have the perfect setup. They can do whatever they want. And so until you speak up, yes, that's true. And at least at this point, with you and with him, you've, you've spoken it and you're there for people and you're out about it. And so if someone else gets into that same situation, knowing the information from you, then, you know, they, they'll, they're the ones that have to deal with the consequences. There's only so much you can do, but I, exactly. I love that. You are so right. I'm so, I'm so proud of you for speaking up. You have a very front and center um, job. What you do is very much in the public eye and you're influencing other women or inspiring them. And the fact that you are w willing to talk about this speaks volume. So I'm, I'm very proud that you are. Thank you. Yeah. I, I definitely like to inspire people. I, as much as it sounds a little bit, um, straightforward, after that situation, and I think it happens again to a lot of victims, even victims of um, like all types of abuse, like even child abuse and, and so on, because it's all abuse at the end of the day, um, these different, you know, situations. I just hated feeling weak. I hated being weak. I, I hated, um, you know, I just hated being, being a weaker person or having anyone I knew feeling the same way so I was like all of a sudden pushed in the other direction and said no I have to be a stronger person and I don't mean like lifting weights at the gym necessarily but I just know I have to be a stronger person and I I'm not going to put up with this anymore and no one else should have to either so that's the kind of mindset I guess I got into straight after that and yeah like I said it happens to so many victims as well they no longer just want to be in a very um, sensitive position anymore and they they feel that you know strengthening other people as well it, you know it's it's a very like I like to think of it as a very empowering thing I do too. I think it's great. So you are really interesting though. You mentioned therapy briefly. What did you do to help yourself heal? And then I am so excited to jump into some of this other stuff. So a lot of counseling, like I know nowadays you can do other things like group sessions or, um, you know, other things like as far as medication goes, but, um, yeah, no, I didn't want to do any of that. I just wanted to do counseling and see how that went. Um, I'm not a big believer in fixing yourself via, I guess, medication, really, at least from a mental point of view, because from what I learned anyway through counseling, the more I spoke with the counselor and the more I put in effort into myself um, emotionally and physically, Yes, it was a long process, but it worked. And, you know, I, I think in those situations, shortcuts aren't necessarily the way to go. So you want to, you know, f again, in, it's in a way repairing yourself. And again, in by doing that, it may be a slower process, but it happened and it happened in a very authentic way. And in the end, especially when you feel level-headed, and you feel that you are in a better place, you can then thank yourself as well as the people you spoke to for, yeah, basically healing yourself. I love it. I'm so glad that you said that because there's nothing wrong when 
I'm, I'm the same way about medication. And there are points where I'm like, you know, I never said it was a horrible thing. I just said it shouldn't be your first option. I think when people mm. need that to bridge the gap, that it's important. You shouldn't not do it if that's where you're at. But when you can take the time and manage it yourself, that's always, I feel, a better way to go. So good for you. And then what did you do? You did something so amazing. This I'm so excited about this. You came from this place where you were really um, emotionally and physically beat down. And I think emotional abuse is worse. I remember being at a point in my life where I looked at a person and said, why don't you just hit me and get it over with? Because the emotional mm. abuse is so horrible to sit through that I would have just preferred to be hit. <laughs> <laughs> that's really awful. And you can't quantify emotional abuse. Well, from this time to this time, he yelled at me and said these things, you know, you, you can show people a bruise that you were physically hurt, but you, you can't quantify emotional abuse and it's so damaging. And so you decided after this therapy and going through all this, that you are going to start a modeling career. And I am like applauding that because holy shit, who does that? <laughs> That was amazing, Jasmine. So why did you decide to do that? And how did you come to that decision? And then how did you do it? And I want to talk about boobs too, because you, I've been on your Instagram and you've made comments about that. And I was like, I was jumping up and down happy that you did. So basically I, like I knew subconsciously that I wanted to do it. I knew subconsciously that I wanted to do something for myself, something just nice and something different. And yeah, one day I made this spontaneous decision to do a photo shoot. Now at that point, at that very point in my mind and on that day, I did not have intentions to make this full fledged career. But in saying that when I was on set doing that photo shoot, I, enjoyed it so much I just wanted to be there all day like I didn't want to necessarily have it over and done with even though I was nervous um I just wanted to I just enjoyed being there and posing for the camera and yeah it was just such a positive experience and admittedly that photo shoot again it wasn't like something special it wasn't like I was shooting for a cover of a magazine or anything so I instantly knew despite you know making it into a career or not that I really enjoyed being in that place and just, yeah, just modeling. So that became like my new passion. It became something that I really loved doing and that, you know, even now, if I'm feeling stressed, often the photo shoot will make me feel better. Like I will be in that place again and I'll just be in a, in a very, yeah, happy, you know, state of mind or, you know, I'll just enjoy it so much. And that often happens when people have a passion or hobby they will do that if they're not feeling their very best and they'll feel better again. So that's how you know that it's something that you truly love. And um, yeah, so from there, I decided to, you know, slowly look into modeling. But every time I'd start, you know, do another photo shoot, at least in those beginning few months, I just realized how much how much I loved it even more and how much I wanted to keep pursuing it. And I mean, at that stage or even prior to that, like when I was a child, I already had all these role models or people that I really loved or loved to look up to. So at that stage, it was like, at least after six months, um, I figured, well, why, why can't I be like them or why can't I do something like what they're doing? And um, I mean, you can call it destiny or you can call it just me being very, you know, passionate and putting effort in, but I started putting my profile up on online at, on proper like talent directories, which I still have it up there. It's really funny. And somebody picked me up from there and they were, I suppose they were like a bit of a scouter and, you know, funny enough, I was sick during that time. And so I was staying home. I had all this free time to, to do whatever and to speak with them. So for three days in a row, we were speaking about, um, modeling and, and yeah, my previous domestic violence and, um, yeah, no, they, they recommended and helped me set up a shoot with a very top glamour photographer in Australia. So I worked with them and then things kind of happened from there. And, um, I won't say, at all that things were very easy because they weren't I had to put in so much work and effort um, but 
that gave me a boost and at the same time it gave me a boost emotionally or mentally so i i felt that you know i could keep going and you know keep putting effort in so i did a lot of things you know i i invested in um one on one modeling lessons to give me you know some sort of foundation i did like some group courses as well i did a lot of research online i networked with people i worked on my posing like almost every day and i still do um nowadays depending how much time i have <laughs> in between all this traveling and what not um and yeah i i have to say i really had to work hard for everything that i achieved right now um i mean at the end of the day people can tell me um that yeah your looks may have helped me or the fact that i had a very you know good manager may have helped me but i still had to put in a lot of effort it definitely wasn't something that was handed to me on a plate so that's something i definitely want to address because often and this even happened to me as a child or even before i started modeling um often a lot of people will will look at all these you know famous celebrities or whoever and think oh they must have had it really easy i mean they must have just walked to where they were now but it's it's definitely not like that no kidding in a in a former life of mine i modeled and it is so much more work than you can ever imagine mm. uh, you know you think you're just taking pretty pictures and isn't it fun it's not like being in your front yard <laughs> It's, it's really, really a lot of work. It can be very uncomfortable. The temperature's not always nice. You know, there's all, you're holding poses for a long period of time. You have to be happy and it's a lot of work. It's a lot more just the actual doing it. Even if you love it and it energizes you and it's a, it releases stress, like you said it did for you, it is still a tremendous amount of work. So yes, I, I am aware of that. So and I love that you told your story about how a scout picked you up. That's fantastic. Mm. So then you're doing this work. You you became, did you have to enter the Glamour Model Competitions? Because you won seven, 2017 and then you were, um, you kept the title through 2018 also, correct? Yeah, so that was something decided by the director because they could really see that I was progressing well um, as a just as a, as a model. And I mean, in saying that, yes, the competition was delayed for a little bit, but I guess if they if they didn't really want to, they wouldn't have extended my title. They wouldn't have said that. They wouldn't have announced that. So, <laughs> I mean it's not often that that happens anyway. So I kind of feel that as well was a rewarding thing to have an extended title. Um, and yes, at the same time I had to enter that competition and the, I, it was like you submitted an online application first and explain why you should be, yeah, why you should be winning the title. And yeah, my photo shoot from that, my photos from that major photo shoot I did were a part of that application um and of course you know by that stage i was already this driven person after everything that happened although i'm not saying i i i had to go through domestic violence in order for that to happen but in again i was this driven person i you know i sincerely and and heartfully wrote you know what i what i wanted to say and you know i submitted and got in so um it was it was like one thing would lead to another, like a domino effect. And again, I'm not saying people have to go through horrific experiences in order to become a successful or strong person. But what I am saying is it's often the people with the most biggest experiences, whether negative or not, um, that can have really bright futures. And that all comes down to you as an individual. If you want it, then go for it. Um, and I mean that obviously in a career perspective. Um, and yeah, again, often people will come out of horrific experiences and feel that they don't deserve, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, feel that they don't deserve to go further. But really it should be the opposite of that. I mean, we are all equal in this world and we're all entitled to live our lives and to do something good with it. And it shouldn't have to come down to how you look like, what your past is, what your family is. It shouldn't have to come down to that. Um, and yeah, I mean, you don't want to waste your life anyway. So I guess, yeah, live it and do the things that really matter to you. I love that. Now you're beautiful. But let's, you made a comment, I, I should have written it down, 
<laughs> but you discussed breast size and augmentation and why you didn't do it. So can you talk about that a little bit? Because that's a, it's a big deal in the media right now, look, looking a certain specific way or mm. the, the volume of women that have breast augmentation and the reason why. And you were like, no, I'm pretty much good with myself. Yeah. So, I mean, I won't lie. I've had other cosmetic procedures, but just not that. And there were two sides to that story. The first one was I cared about my own health. I mean, everyone's health situations are a little bit different. And I kind of felt I was this very slim, petite person. And knowing my own health and knowing my own physical um I mean, obviously, you know, people can tell you everything, but at the end of the day, only you as an individual will know your body at very best. So looking at my own health um, status and looking at my physique, I was like, I'm not sure if I want to get breast implants. I'm not sure if health-wise, medically, if this is the right thing for me. I don't want to do it and have problems down the track. It, it just... I just didn't feel comfortable with that. Um, and I felt, yeah, sometimes people don't care about their health. Some people will do things just for the sake of looking good. But that isn't necessarily a good thing either because if you do get problems, and again, like nobody in this entire world, whether you're a surgeon or whether you're a patient or whoever, is going to be able to predict what's going to happen to you tomorrow. <laughs> there's just no physical way of knowing that so I guess again from a health perspective I just felt this wasn't the right thing for me I'm I wasn't going to go out and tell people other people not to do it because perhaps you know they were in perfect health perhaps for them it was a very good decision for all I knew um, and then there was the other perspective that you needed breast implants to look attractive well you don't you know what I mean everybody yes you know, is entitled to do what they want with their body. And at the end of the day, whether you get cosmetic procedures or not, it, it's got nothing to do with whether or not you're beautiful. You know, if you're beautiful with or without them, there is no like set of rules written somewhere that's saying, yeah, in, in order to be pretty, you have to get A, B, C, and D done. Or in order to be a glamour model, you have to get breast implants and then you have to get this done. But there's no such thing. And unfortunately, through media, maybe not necessarily people, but through the media, a lot of women get this false impression that in, in order for them to be a glam model, maybe, or in order for them to do certain things or to even just look pretty, they have to get things done. But in all due respect, it, it's not the case. I think that both men and both women with and without breast implants are beautiful. And I think that people are going to have a divided opinion, but I like to look at it in a more open way and say that you shouldn't get something done for the sake of something else. You shouldn't get something done because of the media. And you definitely, yeah, you definitely shouldn't get something done or something not done because someone else has told you so, um, you know, and it's, it's very hard because I was hearing this in, in the media and this, this scared me, this worried me even more that there were a lot of even surgeons or medical people that apparently were, were selling their services so much that they were almost like convincing people to get things done that maybe they necessarily didn't want to. So that that was that was very scary for me because I think um, I personally think if you are whether you're in retail or whether you're just in a position of authority of some sort or of care, you shouldn't really be pushing people to do things that they want don't want to do for the sake of your business. So, um, and it's funny me saying that as, as a businesswoman myself, trying to sell like my fan products and what have you, I just know at the end of the day, there's a limit and you definitely shouldn't be pushing that far. And, um, I mean, I can definitely say that, yeah, a lot of people get cosmetic enhancements for many different reasons, but I think, yeah, I think it's bad when you don't really want to do it, but somehow you're being forced to, I think that's when it, things are, I think that's when you have to be worried. I agree. I just love that you spoke up about not getting it done. 
I think that was fantastic because the assumption would be that, oh, well, if you're modeling and it's men, ma men's magazines, that that's something you probably should just get done. And, and I love that you were like, no, it's not. It's not at all. So I want to wrap up with the positivity you found in the community for modeling, because I think there's a stigma on that. You have posed for Playboy seven times. You were on the yep. cover in a year ago, October, 2018 for Playboy Croatia and Playboy of the month for that issue. So tell me about your experience with that, because I think that there's a stigma behind what that means. Yeah. Like obviously people are going to look at that cover even now still and assume what had happened on set or assume whatever. I mean, they can assume all they want, but I just know that I had such an incredible experience on set. Um, I, at the same time of that shoot, which I, I guess doesn't get mentioned enough. I was doing a behind the lens, um, segment with naked news. So they were actually doing a behind the scenes video, which got featured on naked news. Um, with me for Playboy Croatia um, because the photo shoot was in Toronto itself with a well-known Toronto photographer. And yeah, he's known for doing a lot of Playboy shoots. So his name is Anthony Randall. So I always mention his name because he's very, he's a very nice person and a pleasure to work with. So yeah, we were doing the cover for Playboy Croatia in Canada. And yeah, we had this crew down there and I was pretty much not wearing anything. Um, so it was, it was a little bit scary at first, only because that was actually my first, um, well, first of all, it was my first Playboy cover. Second of all, it was my first nude pictorial for Playboy. And then Third of all, it was even my first time doing any sort of that, um, I guess, full-on nude work. I mean, I had done art nude before, and this was technically an art nude shoot, but I guess that whole combination made it feel um, slightly new for me. So, yeah, I, I was a bit nervous, but I think, yeah, I just had an incredible time. Like, if I could redo any moments in life, that would be one of them. Like, I would redo that maybe 10, 20 times because it was, it was just a very good experience working with everyone and being on set. I didn't do nude shoots for Playboy, but I have done two. And it's very empowering. It is not it about is. your, it's, it's not at all about your body being perfect or how you look or what position when you have a really good photographer that's doing shots. It's a still shot of pieces of your body. And it's from an artistic perspective. I mean, in my experience, it was, there's a lot of lines. There's a lot of art. There's a lot of shadowing and it is nerve wracking to be naked. And it was a, it was, it was such a good experience. I did it a second time. <laughs> So, I mean, clearly it didn't bother me and it wasn't at that level at all, but I understand your hesitation and reservation. And then like, wow, this was great. Mm, it was amazing. It was so empowering. And that's why, and again, I, this is where the media may be posting slightly false news anyway, but that's why I don't believe these, um, women who call themselves feminists but say you know what if you if you if you are posing nude or if you are being a model down at the racetrack for formula one you're discouraging other women from being confident and i i think that's really i think it's the opposite because if you're telling people not to do something that's empowering them then you're automatically discouraging them and perhaps anyone else who may in like that you know what i mean so this is where like i think at least in australia with all these really funny things happening at the moment um it's 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 definitely sad to hear that people think that it's okay or to be more precise it's very sad to think that women that some women think it's okay to stop other women from doing things that make them feel better. Because if anything, you should know as a female yourself that feeling like low in confidence is a very bad thing. It can definitely impact the other, you know, aspects of life, whether it's, you know, you're single and you want to date someone or anything else. So this is where I didn't understand that really. It was very, I guess, sad to hear. And um, I'm, I'm very glad or I'm very happy in a way that 
countries like Canada with Naked News and the US with their Playboy and other magazines aren't following that example. Because, um, yeah, a lot of people in the glamour modeling industry were very upset when these things were happening over here. So hopefully things will kind of get better and that won't continue to happen. <laughs> I just love that you're expressing it as such a positive and empowering experience after such a, a negative experience that could have been debilitating to your self-esteem. So I love that message. And so to end, to wrap this up, our time together, which I have thoroughly enjoyed, what advice would you give someone, whether they're coming out of a bad relationship or not, but as far as self-esteem and feeling good? Well, I mean... And this, I want to apply this to both men and women, by the way. Um, when you get out of a negative experience, okay, especially when people are abusing you, right? Because let's face it, um, unless, you've, unless you're a crazy person, you don't want to be abused, right? It's, for starters, it's never your fault. So you're not the one who asked to be abused or wanted to be abused or thinking, oh, yeah, I want to be in this situation. So it's never your fault. So get that definitely nailed in because I think as soon as you take away the blame from yourself, you're going to start feeling better. So yeah, it's never your fault if you're in a bad situation and moving forward from that, if you want to get better from there and you want to be a more better version of yourself, you know, with the help of other people, of course, you don't have to do everything entirely on your own. Start working on yourself. I mean, it will take you as an individual to make that decision to get better or to make that decision to pursue a certain career. So you need to make that decision first and then start working on it. And again, you don't have to do it on your own. You can have someone help you, whether it's one person, whether it's 10 people. I mean, it's, quality over quantity so if you have like three best friends for example or two parents or one parent that's going to help you you know become a better person and move forward then that's great rather than 20 people that aren't really your friends and don't really care enough <laughs> so that's another thing um and then yeah just follow your dreams and live the life that you want to do and remember that you are entitled as long as you're not doing the wrong thing by anyone you're entitled to pursue your dreams and to pursue the things that you want to do there's no such thing as oh because you went through a very bad past, you cannot do this. There's no such thing as that. So that's a lie. And perhaps, you know, for those people who suffered domestic violence, perhaps that was something that their violent partner kind of made them believe, but that wasn't the truth to begin with. So yeah, definitely don't blame yourself for bad things that happened to you. Definitely move forward, try and, you know, work on yourself, invest in yourself and, you know, chase the dreams that you want to pursue. Thank you, Jasmine, so much for being on. I appreciate you so much. No worries. Thank you for taking the time to get naked with us. If you'd like to bear it all, 